Ireland's heroine who had sex in her baby's tomb Ma Gone played a public role in the struggle for Irish independence, but her life also included private tragedy. Her grief over a child who died at the age of two inspired an unpublished poem by W.B. Yeats, and she was so desperate to reincarnate the boy that she had sex in his tomb. Actress, activist, feminist, mystic, Ma Gone was also the muse and inspiration for the poet W.B. Yeats, who immortalized her in some of his most famous verses. After the Free State was established in 1922, Ma Gone remained a vocal figure in Irish politics and civil rights. Born in 1866, she died in Dublin in 1953. But for many years in her youth and early adulthood, Ma Gone lived in France. Of this part of her life, much less is known. There is one long secret and bizarre episode, however, that has now been established as almost certainly true. This was the attempt in late 1893 to reincarnate her two-year-old son, through an act of sexual intercourse next to the dead infant's coffin. Ma Gone was English by birth. Her father, Thomas, was a captain in the British Army, and during part of her childhood the family lived in Ireland. This was where her interest in Ireland began. Later Ma was sent to be educated by a governess in France. There was also a rich aunt who introduced her to society in Paris. She was barely out of her teens when her father died, and not long afterward she began a relationship with a right-wing French politician called Lucien Millevoy. Millevoy was obviously a replacement father figure, says Yates scholar Deirdre Chimie. He was 16 years older than she. Millevoy was a follower of Jean George Boulanger a hardline nationalist who in the late 1880s briefly looked like he might be the future leader of France. Boulangists like Millevoy were obsessed with recapturing the lost eastern territories of Alsace and Lorraine. But Millevoy was also strongly anti-English, and he encouraged Ma Gone in her own growing hostility to the crown in Ireland. Ma had been travelling regularly to Ireland, learning at first hand of the rent strikes and evictions in the countryside. She was increasingly sure her future lay in opposing the English interest in Irish politics. Then on January 30, 1889, in Bedford Park, London, there took place the famous meeting between Ma Gone and the young poet William Butler Yeats. Yeats was immediately overwhelmed. According to his biographer R. F. Foster, Ma Gone appeared to Yeats majestic, unearthly, immensely tall, bronze-haired, with a strong profile and beautiful skin. She was a thin Sielka beauty in Valkyrie mode. It was the start of a mutually obsessive relationship that would last half a century. But what Yates did not discover until very much later was that less than three weeks before this momentous first encounter, Ma Gone had given birth to a baby boy. The baby was called George, he was born in Paris, and he was Lucia Millevoit. Gone, a complicated character if ever there was one, initially kept George's existence secret from Yates. When he did find out about the baby, she insisted that he was not hers but adopted. It is surprising how naive Yeats seems to have been over Gon's child, to me says. He must have wanted to believe that what she said was true about it not being hers. But two and a half years later George was dead. It is not certain how he died, but it was probably meningitis. When Yeats met Gon next, it was in Dublin in October 1891 and she was shattered. By a strange twist, she arrived in Kingstown now done like an air on the same mail boat that brought the body of the just dead Irish politician could hero Charles Parnell. People thought her tears were for Parnell, but they were for George. Over the next two years, in Dublin, London and Paris, the grief-stricken Gone was drawn into the occultist and spiritualist worlds that were already of deep importance to Yeats. Writing many years later in his memoirs, Yeats recalled that Gon repeatedly asked his circle of friends about the reality of reincarnation. One friend, the writer and mystic George Russell, assured her that it was indeed possible to recreate the dead child's soul if the parents went about it in the right way. And so the story leads to a white stone mausoleum in the cemetery of the small riverside town of Samois sur seine 50 kilometers 30 miles southeast of Paris. Ma Gon used to rent a house here to get away from the bustle of Paris and when George died, she had him interred in the town's graveyard. Having inherited a large sum of money on the death of her father, she paid for a memorial chapel, the biggest in the cemetery. In a crypt beneath, the child's coffin was laid. 
in late 1893 Pon recontacted Lucia Milivoy, from whom she had separated after George's death. She asked him to meet her in Samoy's Suter Seine. First the couple entered the small chapel, then opened the metal doors leading down to the crypt. They descended the small metal ladder, just five or six steps. And then, next to the dead baby's coffin, they had sexual intercourse. The evidence comes from Yates. In his posthumous memoirs, not published till 1972, he wrote that Gon herself told him the story. Gon and Yates were always extremely close, says Yates scholar Warwick Gould. And I cannot imagine any reason why she would have made the story up. It is too bizarre and too personal. But it accords with what we know of her interest in reincarnation. 464 Great Line on a Child's Death In 1893 Yates wrote a poem that was never published. It is called On a Child's Death, and it is clearly inspired by Maud Gaunt's dead son, and her consequent grief, though when he wrote it Yates still thought George was adopted. Scholars say it is of uneven quality, which is why Yates did not want it to be part of his canon. You shouted we are mice of the dead why did you take the starlight head the faltering feet, the little hand? For purple kings are in your band and their the hearts of poets beat. Why did you take the faltering feet? She had much need of some fair thing to make love spread his quiet wing above the tumult of her days and shut out foolish blame and praise. She has her squirrel and her birds but these have no sweet human words and cannot call her by her name. Their love is but a woodland flames you wealthy armies of the dead why did you take the starlight head? On a child's death was reproduced with the permission of Katri Anna Yates line the purpose of the act was to recreate the baby's soul and the new baby that she would conceive with the same father. By having sex next to the corpse, it was hoped that the process of metempsychosis, the transmigration of the soul, would be made easier. Whether the soul of George transmigrated is a matter for metaphysicians. What is certain is that in August 1894 Maud Gone had another baby. This was her daughter Assault. Ma Gon brought up the child as her own, but their relationship was always odd. Later she refused to call her daughter in company, instead describing her as a kinswoman or cousin. As an adult Isul had an affair with Ezra Pound and married the controversial Irish-Australian novelist and Nazi sympathizer Frances Stewart. She died a year after her mother, in 1954. Ma Gon, meanwhile, converted to Catholicism much to Yates' dismay and in 1903 married the Irish soldier and Republican, John McBride. With him she had her third child, who grew up to be the Irish politician, I.R. Daleader, international statesman and Nobel Peace Prize winner Sean McBride. John McBride was shot by the English in the Easter Rising of 1916. Sean McBride lived until 1988. The Gone Mausoleum in Samoy's Souter Seine was long forgotten. Few knew the story of Ma Gon's dead baby, almost no one knew the story of the secret sex. Occasionally Yates scholars would come to pay a visit out of curiosity. But in the town, once the generations had moved on, they had never heard of Ma Gon. Interest in the cemetery resided solely in its other famous occupant, the jazz guitarist D. Django Reinhardt. Today though, there is a small resurgence of interest. Intrigued by the mausoleum, Local councillor Joseph Dufour conducted her own research and has now written a short monograph on the George Gaughan story. The mausoleum no longer belongs to the Gaughan family. Though the plot was bought by Gaughan in perpetuity in practice the freehold had to be renewed, and it wasn't. But inside the Grecian-style edifice, there are still the metal doors in the ground. Joseph Dufour provided a key for the padlock. And there in the crypt, on a small trestle, lies the coffin of baby George. It is in fact a double coffin, because for transport from Paris the law stated that the original coffin had to be encased in another. On the lid are some crumbling flowers made of papier mache or some other material. And a plank bears his name, George Gone. Born January 11, 1889. Died August 31, 1891. When she died in 1953, Ma Gons will bore no reference to Isult but she asked to be buried with George baby shoes in her coffin.